All right, welcome back to part six of the Razorcrest series. In this video, we're gonna be going over the V-Ray frame buffer. So this will be everything you need to get started. We're not gonna talk about the light mix or the composite features. Those are really amazing features, but they're too long for this video. But I'll be showing you just about everything else. So if that sounds interesting, let's get started. So in the first part of the lecture, I kind of left off with the same file. If I select the viewport IPR for V-Ray, we can just get a quick preview of where we left off. So we had everything surfaced. We put all our textures there, created materials, and then we had a sunlight system. This viewport IPR is really nice, but a lot of times you actually want a bit more control. So this is really good. You can manipulate stuff and you can get real-time feedback or close to real-time feedback. But if you want to compare images or you want to save your file or make adjustments, that's when the V-Ray frame buffer is very handy. So I'm going to be on my V-Ray tab here. If you don't see a V-Ray shelf, it doesn't matter. You can just click on V-Ray up here and then say show V-Ray VFB, V-Ray frame buffer, or you can just click this little icon here. And we briefly used this last time, but now I want to explain a few more things that you can do with it. So let's just start the IPR, the little teapot icon there. And there's some really useful things that you can do. So the first thing, let's start on the left hand side and then we'll work our way across. So the first thing here is history. So if you don't see your history, you can go up to options, VFB settings. Then go all the way over to history and you want to enable history. And then for the location, it's more convenient usually just to use your project path. So just select that. And then there's a whole heap of other options that you can do. So if you click show advanced settings there's very specific things that you can do it's not particularly important for what we need though the only thing that we really need is to make sure that it is enabled so then you uh, you click save and close but i didn't really save anything because i already have it so this is a common feature in most frame buffers or render views and that is to save a snapshot or save history the v-ray calls this history so you can simply click this little button here and then you can do something else. So for example, let's say I'm just going to move this down here and I want to grab my sun and then I want to just make it a little bit brighter. So I'll, I'll say like that. So I just doubled the intensity and maybe I wanted to change the sky model too. I wanted to do improved instead. So if I wanted to compare what both of those were, I can click history again on the second one. Then I can stop the IPR. It's always safer if you're going to be doing a lot of operations to stop the IPR because it does require your computer to, you know, be processing any change. So if you don't want to make any other change, just click the stop. You can also click the pause button. So when this is not play, it'll be set to pause. And then when I click stop, by default, it will always save another view. So one of the other things you can do on history is delete history. So you can delete a frame that way. So I just wanted to use these two right here. So to view another frame, you just double click it and then you can see it. Double click the newest one and you can see the newest one. But if you want to compare them though, you can select this little A, B button. You can click A, which is going to be your first one. And then you select whichever other one you want to compare it with. So you could have an entire stack here of lots of different images. So here I only have two, but I can click B. And then on the A, B, if we, if we hold this down, you can do A, B horizontal vertical, or you can do four different ones if you had four, but let's just do horizontal. And then it, you get this little slider and you can simply drag the slider across and then compare specific parts of the frame to the other version. So B is going to be on this side and A is going to be on this side. And it's a really useful feature for navigating the V-Ray frame buffer. If you hold down the middle mouse button and click and drag, which is a little bit unusual because by default in Maya, you have to hold down the alt button. But V-Ray's like primary DCC is 3ds Max. And in 3ds Max, you have to hold down the middle mouse button to navigate. But just get used to it. It's, it's fine to, to go back and forth between them. Now, let's say that you've zoomed in on something and you want to see your full view. You can click the F button to focus, which is the same thing as focusing in Maya. And that's fine. And then if you don't want to have these A, B things anymore, you can simply select your A, B again, and then they go away. So moving to the right here, this shows you your passes 
or render elements or AOVs. Right now we don't have any. We just have your we just have the beauty or the RGB color. And we also have alpha. So you can see that the geometry is separated from the background. So this doesn't act as a map. If you had an HDRI, then your alpha would be completely solid and it would just be white everywhere. You also have the ability to view single channels at a time. So you can say, hey, I just want to view the red channel or I want to do red and green or blue and red. So you can separate them that way. And then you can also view to switch the alpha channel here directly without having to go to the drop down. If you're going to save an image, you have multiple options for saving. So you can do current channel, which is whatever you have selected here. You can say just save everything to separate files. So if you did that, it would save one image for RGB color, one for alpha. And then you also have save everything to a single file. So this is going to save out an EXR, which we'll go over in a little bit. Let's say your V-Ray frame buffer though is kind of crowded and don't actually want this image. You can click this, clear image, and then it completely clears the frame buffer. Another really useful thing is this right here, which is the follow mouse. So follow mouse is not really going to be as apparent if I try this now. But if I click the start IPR, I can start down here and it's going to work its way up. And as I mouse over parts of the ship, you can see those parts are going to be worked on. So if you had a really large image that takes a long time to render, but you just want to see if certain parts of it are rendering properly, you can do follow mouse and you can hover over the area that you want to focus on and it will render that part first. So not something that I use a lot, but it is kind of useful. Just remember though, you want to turn it off because sometimes it can be a little bit awkward if that's left on. You can also do test resolution. So let's say you're working in 4K and you don't want to have to keep changing your render settings every time you just want to quickly look at a preview. You can click the 50%, which will make everything really, really tiny. And then you actually do have to physically like zoom in to see it. You can also do like all the way down to like 10%. And then you do have to kind of readjust your frame buffer, which is kind of annoying, but you can see that's what 10% would be. So if you have very large images, it's very useful. And likewise, you can also go above that as well. You can never go back to 100% though without just clicking this button again, which will take you back to 100%. We also have a really useful feature here, and this is a newish feature, which is kind of cool. Let's say I only wanted to look at this engine. I can select this, and then it's only going to view the engines, so whatever that object is. So if I move that, that both engines are selected, they're one object. And this is really, really useful if you want to see just that one object being rendered, but you want to like play around with your materials, for instance. So I could go into my materials here. Then I can say, hey, I want to see what this looks like with no reflection color. And we can kind of see what that specific channel is doing, which is really cool. Especially if you have a very heavy scene or a very heavy object that takes a long time to render. This is a very, very useful way of just isolating that specific object. You also can do specific things like uh, view your UVs, for instance. And then there are other options as well here like view wireframes and stuff like that. Uh, we can also pause the IPR. So if we don't necessarily want to stop it, we just want to, you know, pause it. You can pause it there or you can stop it. Now to do an actual full render, we can click the teapot here and this will render the entire scene. And this will take a lot longer than IPR because it is actually using whatever settings you have in render settings and applying those to the image. So this is taking considerably longer than just the IPR. IPR, it tries to get you a view really, really quickly, even if it's a little bit rough in places, and then it gradually just refines it over and over and over again. This works in a very similar way, and I'll also show you bucket rendering in a little bit, so you can see the difference between that. So when that is done, automatically this will pop up in your history, and this is the completed frame tells you this was 33.5 seconds. And another really cool thing is you can you can right click over these images and then you can say edit note this one or something like I don't know, like you, you wanted to say, hey, this is the one I wanted to use. The other ones are not as good or whatever. Very useful to to do that. Uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention, this little button here 
It's the same thing as double clicking an image. So you can just select that and we'll load whatever image you have selected. Or you can just double click it. it doesn't really matter. All right. So on the left hand side, we have a few things that are useful. We have statistics. So if you wanted to get into the nitty gritty of like how many threads your computer has or what the total RAM is or how, how much RAM was it actually using? What, what's the timings of these? It displays all of this information, total number of triangles and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool, uh, not particularly useful for our class. So in this stack, we have our display correction, which I explained in the previous video. This allows you to set your color profiles. So here we are using ASUS CG, which is listed right here. Older versions of Maya by default uses sRGB. So if you select sRGB, everything's going to look a little bit off because V-Ray is rendering an ASUS space, but you're trying to view it with an sRGB profile, so it's not really the same. We also have Gamma 2.2. These two things are very, very similar. And the Gamma of sRGB is about 2.2, but sRGB also includes what's called a color primary. It's basically like a lookup table for telling your software what colors it should choose. It just helps it out because there's a lot of different color spaces and the computer might not know what do, what do you mean by red you know it, it, you gotta like tell it so usually things are in srgb but in this case we are using the open color io and asus cg this will be set as default so you can change these things if you had to for a specific project but i think going forth asus is going to be the the standard and you'll kind of forget about using srgb so that's fine we also have some really useful things here called lens effects. So if I if I select this and say enable bloom and glare, you might not actually notice anything at all. But when we did that, we get a new render element or render pass or AOV. And that is called glare. And now you can see we have like a little little glint right there. So these are really useful for compositing and you can, you know, increase the size of this and you can kind of blow it out that way. You can increase the intensity. And depending on what you do, you might not actually see that much of a change. We also have a bloom and glare slider, but it's not really a slider anymore. It just says bloom. So if you say zero bloom is only going to be a glint. And if you say one, it's only going to be bloom. So glint is going to give you that kind of lens flary look. If you had that at zero, it's going to be much more like a, a specular hit that you might see on like some shiny car. And if it's like just something that's really kind of glowing almost, that's going to be what Bloom is. So this is something you often see in, in games. You'll see Bloom and it makes your specular highlights just kind of glow. It's a nice look sometimes and it is something that cameras will produce. And you can even to a certain extent kind of see that with your eyes, like something that's super bright would have kind of a fringing around it and that allows you to do that so we have some controls for that you can do things like lens scratches lens dust all of this stuff you can change the shape of the aperture all sorts of stuff like this it's useful we'll use it later on but for right now we don't really need it so i can just disable that and then go back to the rgb color okay so we also have denoising so we'll talk about denoising a little bit later uh, we have to set that up before we get to this V-Ray frame buffer in the render settings. And this is going to be very, very useful for our project. So because the render times on this might actually get a little bit long, denoising kind of removes grain and it can drastically improve render times because it doesn't have to render out all the grain. It can leave a grainy image and then it can just get rid of it later just by using some algorithms to detect where grain is and kind of smooth it out. Very, very useful. So then we have our source. There's some useful stuff called light mix and composite. I never use composite. Light mix though is very, very useful, but we need to actually have lights to be able to do anything useful with it. And for right now, we only have one light. Okay, so some other things that are very useful and we will start to use them later is if you click this little button up here, we can create all sorts of basic corrections, like basic color corrections like we have in After Effects, plus a few other ones. So for example, we can grab curves and we'll get a little implementation of curves here. So if we know that for whatever reason, 
we can't get the scene looking quite right and we know we're going to have to do something in After Effects or whatever compositor you're using, you can quickly kind of preview what that's going to look like. So you can say, hey, I, I want my curve to be way more contrasty or I just want everything to be brighter or whatever the adjustment may be. You have the options to use these curves here or you can do things like white balance. So white balance is very useful. You can make your image kind of much warmer or much cooler. And these are things that are very, very useful when you're trying to get the look. You can see them in the in Maya. So if you if you need to change something, you don't have to go back from After Effects and then render it out again and then save and then re-import that into After Effects. You can do it directly in the frame buffer. And for certain cases, you might actually really like the corrections that you've done. And it is possible to bake these changes in. Although for our class, we're never going to do that because it kind of breaks our workflow. So we're not going to do that. But let's say that you got the most absolute perfect color and you're like, oh, I love this. I wish I could have this in After Effects. What you can do over display correction, right click, you can say save all CC. So that's color correction basically as a LUT and LUT is a lookup table. And then you can re-import that. It's called a cube file into After Effects. And then you can get the same transformations that you could in the frame buffer. All right, so there's a whole, a whole heap of stuff that we can do with that. Hope that kind of clears up where you can find stuff. Some tutorials and some older tutorials that I made relied on an older version of V-Ray, so it was V-Ray Next. So this one is V-Ray 5. So V-Ray 5, they changed their frame buffer and admittedly, some stuff was a little bit confusing where it is, but that is basically for all that we need. If you are also interested at the bottom here, you can hover over different parts of the image and it will give you the value of every pixel. And you can say that in, see that in raw or you can see direct RGB. And then you can also change how these colors are perceived. So 8-bit is, we'll never do that. But if you wanted to see what this would look like on the web, it's gonna be a little bit different than what you would see in After Effects, for example, because of the bit depths and, and the color primaries. Okay. so. That's getting into a lot of information. We don't really need that right now. So actually what we can do, we don't want any of these anymore. We can delete them. So then we can just select all of those, just shift select them and then delete. And then if you want to clear the frame buffer, you click this button and now we are completely good to go. If I want to clear these adjustments that I made, simply click on what the color correction layer was and I click delete. Okay, so I can just minimize this. And for the next part, what we want to do is set up our render passes so we can see those in the V-Ray frame buffer as well. All right, guys, thanks for watching. As we progress through the series, there will be more features that I show you with the V-Ray frame buffer. In fact, the next part, we're going to go over V-Ray render elements or AOVs or render passes, and we'll view those in the frame buffer as well. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.